Father God, thank you. Thank you. Lord, you're good. Yes. And you're faithful. Yes, Lord. Lord, inspire us. Yes.
And one thing I want to leave us with is this, is that thankfulness stems from or comes from thoughtfulness. Mm -hmm. Where are you going with this preacher? In Psalms 97 and 12 it says this, Rejoice in the Lord, yeah. ye righteous, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. Mm -hmm. See, when you think about who God is, and also think about how he's come through for you, it ought to cause you to give thanks. See, thankfulness stems from thoughtfulness. Mm -hmm. Many a times we've complained, we've said different things, and we've even opened our mouth as if God isn't who he is. But how many of you know that one who falls in that category has forgotten about all the things that God has done already? Amen. Thankfulness stems from thought. Well, when you look at Psalms 1, it says this. It says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. But there's some benefits from doing that. It says, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth fruit in his season. I'm here to tell you, when your thought pattern is right, you can blossom even in the midst of what looks like a drought around you because you are connected to the rivers of water through Jesus the Christ. Amen. We've got to understand that meditating and thinking on the right things is what causes us to have a grateful attitude. Amen. My Lord, my Lord, my Lord. Help me. Holy Spirit, if nobody else will. Watch me now. In Hebrews 13 and 5, it says this. It says, let your conversation. Let the church say conversation. Conversation. Now. I want to share with you that that doesn't mean me talking to you and you talking to me. See, when you do a study, you've got to understand that it means something totally different. That conversation there does not mean a talk with somebody. It means your conduct. Mm -hmm. The way you carry yourself. So, if you will, I'm going to read it as such. Let your conduct be without covetousness. So, that means that the Hebrew writer is getting us to understand that we ought to behave in a certain manner. Okay? I, I, I pray I bless you. I pray I bless you. Watch me now. This conversation means way of life or conduct, manner, fashion, how you what? Carry yourself. See, I'm here to tell you it's not about what leaves your lips, but it's about how you live your life. Amen. See, we can give lip service all day long and we can talk about how good God is all day long and we can talk about his goodness and his grace and his mercy all day long but does your life reflect the way you talk it says let your conduct be without covetousness well you got to understand when we look at the christian we ought to expect more of ourselves than the world expects of us where you going with that preacher how many of you have ever heard folks say, yeah, you call yourself a Christian? How many of you have ever gotten talked about because of some of the things that you've done? Mm -hmm. But how many of you know the world holds us to a higher standard than we even do ourselves? Yes. Mm -hmm. right. yes. And that's a travesty because I'm here to tell you what we're doing is we're allowing grace to abound because we'll make the statement, God loves me, he knows my heart, and guess what? His grace shall take care of me. But you've got to understand this one thing. A heart that does not seek to please 
look at being a Christian, you ought to look a certain way. You ought to have a certain way about you. You ought not be doing what other folk do. That's not of God. But when we look at our lives, sometimes, just sometimes, as Christians, we look no different than the world. We don't talk about God, and when we do, it's a, Lord, thank you for getting me out of this mess that I just got myself in. Mm -hmm. But we never talk of God. We always talk of other stuff, other folk, ourselves, and everything else. But at the same time, we got to understand that our lives ought to look a certain way. It reminds me of an oxymoron. Now, many people might listen to the word and say, oh, that's an insult. No. What an oxymoron is, is that you're saying two opposite things in the same sentence referring to one main or particular idea. Hmm. Watch me now. As Christians, we should not be tricky trustees, ugly ushers, and devilish deacons. No. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. That's an oxymoron. Mm -hmm. What do I mean? Our walk and what we do ought to look like Christ. Mm -hmm. Well, preacher, what you're saying, I ought to be perfect, preacher. That I ought to have everything together, preacher. No, it's just this. To where you get to a certain point in your life, to where you're seeking to grow up in the Lord, and you're seeking to get certain places in the Lord. Why? Because each day that goes by, I don't care if you're two. 20, 92, you ought to always be growing in the Lord. Amen. And what we do makes a difference. Mm -hmm. It does. It, 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 really, it really does. And, and, and as Christians, if you look at it, we are all walking just like an oxymoron. Mm -hmm. Cussing Christians. Conceited Christians. Mm -hmm. Cocky Christians. Crazy Christians should not be in the same sense. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we ought to look different. Yeah. Bible says that we are holy, set apart. We ought to look a little bit different than everything and everybody. Or what you saying, preacher? I don't. I shouldn't enjoy myself, and I should do this, and I should no. But I'm here to tell you that what has happened is the church has. Because we don't see God. We don't look no different. We've been doing the same thing we've been doing all our lives. And folk, guess what? Have been letting us do it. Nobody's holding us accountable. We ain't holding ourselves accountable. And guess what? We ain't getting nowhere. Why? Because we don't take our conduct in high status. It says, let your conduct be without covetousness. Well, I'm going a, I'm to a, I'm a move right along. And the Lord already shared with This ain't no shopping message. Mm -hmm. So you ain't got to shop. But I just pray you understand what I'm yeah. trying to get yeah. you to Come on now. Yeah. It says, be without covetousness. Let the church say covetousness. Covetousness. Now, when you look at that word covetousness, when you look at that word covetousness, it means this. It means to be a lover or chaser. Of money, a chaser of stuff, mm -hmm. and a chaser of what the world has to offer. Hmm. Hmm. It, 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 it means this, this big old word, avaricious, and this is what it means having or showing an extreme greed for wealth or material gain. Mm -hmm. Now, 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 preach, now, you talking about being satisfied in Jesus. Where are you going with this? Follow me. I'm driving. Just follow me. I promise you that I'm going to take you somewhere. It says, be without covetousness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, how many of you know that as believers, we can run the risk <laughs> of falling to where we seek stuff and stuff mm -hmm. becomes our pursuit yeah. and mm -hmm. stuff becomes 
comes our God. Hmm. Bible says you can't love God and stuff. Mm -hmm. Watch me now. See, it's kind of like this. We should never be obsessed with wanting more stuff. Mm -hmm. How do you know that some people have made the statement, if I could have more money, I'd be sick. <laughs> if I had a better salary, I'd be all right. And the Lord looking at you, you can't handle them two pennies. You got how I'm going to give you 20 more. Mm -hmm. But how many of you know that we should not be in the business of being obsessed with wanting more? It kind of reminds me of this. How many of you heard stories about lottery winners and what happens to certain lottery winners? Watch me now. Check it out. I'm going to read an article that I looked up, and it's in USA Today. It says this, Steve Granger, 53, of Henderson, North Carolina, won $900,000 in the West Virginia Lottery in September 2006. He received about $600,000 after taxes and put most of it away for his wife, his and his wife's retirement. But he says there have been many unpleasant moments. All of a sudden, everybody knows your business. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows what you have. Mm -hmm. And a part of it, Granger heard someone say in an ugly tone, there go those lottery people. And as he passed, and he and his wife passed by, and the man he hardly knew asked him to invest in a gold mine. <laughs> He said, I went through a phase where everybody was grabbing me thinking I was going to give them luck. <laughs> Watch me. Now, here's another family. Portland, the Portland Press Herald of the Associated Press. Patricia and Oren Wales won a share of $294.8 million, a Powerball lottery in 2001. Within days of winning a $41 million share, of a Powerball jackpot in 2001, Patricia and Erwin Wells of Boston, Maine were sued by co-workers who claimed to be co-winners. The lawsuit was dropped, but the lawyer Terrence Garnett said a new beginning for the clerk and the lawn maintenance man was not an easy transition. Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, the Wells were beset with requests by friends they didn't know they had and by investment companies who wanted to handle their money. They hired a team of lawyers to help them and set aside $5 million for a nonprofit charitable foundation that contributed $263,000 in 2005 to the community and religious causes in and near Boston. Now watch. Here's some other stories that came about. Check this out. William Bud Post, who won $16.2 million in Pennsylvania Lottery in 1988, had a brother who tried to kill him. <laughs> yeah, for his inheritance. <laughs> but at the same time, here's the, the, the flip part. Post lost and spent all of what he had. No. He was living off of Social Security when he died. <laughs> Watch me now. Two years after winning the 31 million Texas lottery in 1997, Billy Bob Harold Jr. committed suicide. He had bought cars, real estate, gave money to his family, church, and friends. After his death, it was not clear whether there was money left for the estate taxes. Hmm. Here's another. Victoria Zell, who shared an 11 million Powerball and have an $11 million Powerball with her husband in 2001 is serving time in a Minnesota prison. Her money is gone. Zell was convicted in March of 2005 in a drug and alcohol induced collision that killed one person and paralyzed another. Yeah. Mm. Evelyn Adams, who won the New Jersey lottery twice in 1985 and 1986, for a total of 5.4 million gambled and gave away all her money. By 2001, she was more broke than the Ten Commandments when Moses dropped them on Mount Sinai. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry Bayer, who 
teaches a state law at Texas Tech University has written about people who come into sudden wealth, such as lottery winners, sports figures, actors and actresses, and how they end up losing it. Many don't realize that if they spend their money rather than investing and living off the earnings, there's nothing to replace it. Hmm. Preacher, you read all that and what you try to say. If I get money, or I shouldn't try to come up, or I shouldn't try to get nothing, or I shouldn't try to be nothing in life, would you say I ought to just be happy with where I am and not try to pursue nothing? No, Pastor, I'm not saying that. Don't leave here with that. Because folk got a way of taking what you say and reinterpreting it and sharing it with other folk the way they want to interpret it. Yeah. Take it the way I'm giving it to you. See, when the pursuit of money and quote unquote happiness becomes your purpose for living, you are not living at all. Now, if I am a believer in Jesus the Christ, I must understand that even in my pursuits, that what I pursue, I'm seeking to please God with all that I get. But when my pursuit is for personal gain and wealth, then and only then, it only shows that guess what? God is not my God, and guess what? I'm serving something or someone yeah. else. Mm -hmm. You see, God don't mind blessing you. God don't mind giving you. And God don't mind you moving up the ladder. But God wants you to understand and know that it's by His grace and by His mercy, by His will, and by what He allows that causes you to be able to get all that stuff. Because mm -hmm. I'm here to tell you, when the stock market crashed, you heard more suicide than a little bit. Amen. <laughs> Why? Because their trust was in their money. We should never ever get to the point to where our pursuit of money is our main goal. How many of you know that a person that's always trying to Get money, get money, get money is an unsatisfied soul. And how many of you know that our youth of today, that's all they preach and teach about in our songs today? But guess what, parents? We don't look at it and we don't realize it, but the music of today is their ministry. <laughs> Y'all don't see it, but it's a ministry. Oh, how is a ministry? Anything that feeds you and causes you to live a certain way, it ministers to you. And when we look at our self-centered world, and we look at our world of trying to get cribs and cash and all these cars, and guess what? How many of you know that some folks, some folks, not everybody, that when they get a little something in their pocket and they drive a certain kind of car or they live at a certain address or they have a certain amount of money in their bank account, yeah, their little neck start to rise a little bit higher. Like they better than somebody else. All right. But how many of you know that some of us got to remember from whence we came? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the cotton fields, eating cornbread <laughs> and milk. Mm -hmm. Heard a man yesterday, he said, I thank the Lord for his grace and his mercy. Because I remember back in the day when we used to go out and we picked that cotton, we had three meals. Cornmeal, oatmeal, and no meal at all. <laughs> Because he remembered from whence he came. How many of you know that as Christians we got to always stay rooted in the word of God? Amen. That the enemy is right around the corner trying to get you to be prideful, stick your chest out, and act as if the money is taking care of you. How many of you know that, guess what, the money can get cleared out tonight? That's right. Without you even knowing it. Amen. How many of you ever heard of identity theft? Mm -hmm. And guess what? You have no control over it. But at the same time, you got to understand that it's God that blesses us with what we have. How dare I, how dare we look at other folk as if they haven't arrived because they don't live at our address or because they don't drive what we drive. Amen. Right? Says that in Proverbs 27 and 20, it says this. Hell and destruction are never full. Mm -hmm. So the eyes of man 
are never satisfied. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ecclesiastes 5 and 10 says this. He who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver, nor he who loves abundance with increase. This also is vanity. Mm -hmm. And how many of you know the wisest man that ever lived and walked the earth besides Jesus the Christ who Solomon in Ecclesiastes realized that all the stuff that he had done was all vanity. Because he realized that gaining all that stuff didn't make him more better. How many of you know it really messed him and jacked him up with all the wives and mistresses and other wives? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. How many of you know that the devil will tempt us. The more we get, that's the more temptation we'll have. Mm -hmm. Come in now. How many of you know? Now, how, now, now I don't want to say I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think I'm talking about nobody. I'm just talking about what I'm talking about. Black Friday just passed. <laughs> and don't, it don't fit everybody's bill, but I know it fits some. You got folk in the store can't afford none of what they buy. Mm -hmm. Buying on credit. Trying to get stuff, accumulating acquired stuff just to say they got it. But at the same time, can't keep up with their life bill. Something wrong with that. Amen. Something wrong with that. Some folk, they can't afford it. They, they house, they got all kinds of stuff in the house. And guess what? Trying to give stuff away and need to give stuff away and they still buying more stuff. Amen. Really and truthfully, we got to look at it from this perspective. That when we look at our lives, we can't be centered around allowing stuff to validate us. And allowing the pursuit of money to make us happy. How many of you know that happiness is temporary but joy is eternal? Amen. Amen. See, happiness is only predicated on what's going on at the present moment. Mm -hmm. Joy is when, guess what, all you got is the ramen noodles to eat with a big old glass of cool. And Lord, I'm going to bless you anyhow. Yes. Because why? Because joy says that God will take care of me. I might not have everything that I want, but I have everything that I need. Follow me, follow me, follow me. And it says, and be content. The church say content. Content. That means satisfied. That, 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 that just means that just means satisfied. That, 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 that means that you have what you have and that you're satisfied with what you have. Hmm. See, watch me now. Contentment comes from a divine attitude of gratitude. Hmm. All right, watch me now. There's this psychological disorder and it's called affluenza. Okay? Some of you may know what I'm talking about. Some of you may have heard about it. But there's this psychological condition called affluenza. Now, when we look at that affluenza, really truthfully, I have another name for it, but I care not to share it. But it's this. It's a psychological condition supposedly affecting wealthy young people, symptoms of which include lack of motivation, Feelings of guilt and a sense of isolation. Here's another definition. Extreme materialism, which is the impetus for or the driving force for accumulating wealth and for overconsumption of good. How many of you, yeah, then went to that buffet, you know you eat more than what you need to eat. Oh, and they will unbuckle your buckle yeah. and say, yeah, I think I ate too much. For real? Really? <laughs> My Lord, how many of us can say the Lord bless us with just a little bit extra and by the time we got it, it was gone. And we could have used it for something more productive. Mm -hmm. Watch me now, watch me now. It says this, also feelings of guilt and isolation from the dysfunctional pursuit of wealth and goods. Here's another. Social condition that affects a society because of the elevated number of individuals striving to be wealthy. People within the society feel that the only measure of success is determined by how much money and prestige a person has. Hmm. 
Here's one last definition that I found. A social theory claiming that individuals with very privileged or wealthy backgrounds sometimes struggle to determine the difference between right and wrong due to the nature of their upbringing, also known as a sudden wealth syndrome. We look at this concept of affluenza. All it means is this. Is that I got what I got, but I want more. I have what I have, but I want more. I got all the stuff that I need, but I want more. But at the same time, how many of you know that we can get to the point to where wanting more gets us to the point to where we're not satisfied? I've heard it time after time after time after time after time again. The pursuit of money and the, 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 the pursuit of trying to get things have broken up on mm -hmm. I've heard it time after time after time again. The pursuit of getting wealth and the pursuit of trying to come up has caused people to commit crimes. Mm -hmm. How many of you know that the love of money, not money itself, money is good. But the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Folk will kill you for your money. Folk will cheat you out of your money. Folk will try to manipulate you out of your money. Why? Because we love money. And I'm talking about society as a whole. Let's be real. And let's, let's, let's just be real. Coming up. What were you told was success? Boy, true, good job. Nice house. Nice car. Then you got it. You just made it. See, you got to understand, it ain't about all that stuff. Because when we allow stuff to validate us, then what it does is it gets us to the point to where now mm, it's the stuff that's driving me to do. But you see, how many of you know that the Lord wants us to be ministry minded? How many of you know that Jesus Christ said himself that birds have nests and foxes have holes, but the Son of Man has no way to lay his head? See, you got to understand, Jesus Christ, we talk about, I want to be like crap. No, we don't want to be like crap. Because mm -mm. mm -mm. mm -mm. see, Christ traveled preaching the gospel. Mm -hmm. Christ traveled meeting needs. Christ traveled looking for opportunities to be a blessing to folk. <laughs> we don't want to be like Christ. Because see, if we wanted to be like Christ, our spiritual eyes would open and we quit being selfish and we start doing more stuff for other folk. Mm -hmm. But when we get caught up and doing me, doing me, doing me. Young folk, you can relate. I'm going to do me, and you do you. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. They know what I'm talking about. Because you, know, you got you to understand that that's how, that's, that's where we at now. But at the same time, God's word never changed. Never changed. Mm -hmm. God's word is still the same, and all I'm saying is this, that our priorities need to get right. Mm -hmm. Watch me now. Look what it says here. It says, And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its desires and passions. That's Galatians 5 and 24. How many of you know that contentment only comes from a divine attitude of gratitude? You can't be content in and of yourself. Mm -hmm. It comes from being connected with Jesus the Christ. Look at Romans 13 and 14. It says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. How many of you know that our flesh, our wants, and our desires, if you don't get them under subjection, can cause several things to happen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now watch me. Now I'm about to say something, and I pray it. I pray to take it out of the spirit which I'm giving. See, how many of you know we pray for folk who won't listen to the doctor. Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. All right. Watch me now. Help me with this. 
We're praying for folk who won't eat right. They won't exercise. And all they're doing is consuming, consuming, consuming. And yet at the same time, the die saying, cut back on your salt. They still consume it. Cut back on your sugar. They still consume it. You need to cut back on it. Still consume it. How many of you know that this flesh is never satisfied? Because mm -hmm. we want what we want and we're going to get what we want at any cost, even if it kills us. Amen. Now, I know that wasn't going to go over real well, but I know I'm right. Mm -hmm. And people of God, we got to quit praying for financial blessing and knowing that we're checking on our finances. Want God to bless what we're doing, but we want budget. We want restructure what we're doing, and we want discipline ourselves to get right. But we pray for God to come through on our behalf. Help me out with that. Come on now. Want God to heal us, want God to fix it all, but we won't even rearrange our lifestyle so that we can live a healthy life. Mm -hmm. How many of you know that many times we just want God to bless our mess? Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Ooh, yeah. Jesus. But I'm going to preach it anyway. <laughs> Because you've got to understand that how many of you know that you play a part in God's blessings in your life to the point to where the Bible says faith without works is dead. dead. I want my marriage to get better and I'm still cussing and fussing and fighting and doing all kinds of stuff. No, that ain't going to cut it. Yeah. I want my, my, want my home to be at peace. But yet when you come in, you're like, your head spinning around like an exorcist. <laughs> but what this flesh, this flesh just want what? Want what it want. I want what I want. I'm going to get what I want. I'm going to get my weight. I'm going to get what I want in my body. I want what I want. I want what I want. I want what I want. What I want. How many of you know that's how addictions come about? <clears throat> Because why? That which we are addicted to pleases our flesh. Mm -hmm. But how many of you know it's only but for the moment? Mm -hmm. Now some people, see, they label it to, you know, drugs and, you know, sex and all this other stuff. But there's some other addiction out yes, there. Sir. Yes, right. Amen. See, we put those on the side. Said, yeah, we put those, and we put them other ones. You know, them, them, them heavy hitters. Yeah, in the front. Girl, you, you heard about what they had done? Yeah, yeah but uh, yeah, yeah, we don't know your issue. <laughs> but we consume, 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 consume. Do what we want in this flesh, and it's what never, ever. <laughs> How many of you know the Christian life is a disciplined life? Yeah. But nobody wants to discipline themselves to be the Christian that they should be. Mm -hmm. Paul says that I must get this flesh under subjection. Because it's a fight every day. Mm -hmm. It is spiritual warfare. Yeah. Yeah. Lord have mercy. I pray I'm blessing somebody right now. Yes, sir. Look yes, what sir. it says. Look what it says. With such things as ye have. That means what you got in your hand. Mm -hmm. Now watch. Help me out right now. I, I'm about to bless this. And if you don't get blessed, you ain't want to get blessed. It says, with such things as you have. Many of us have family in our lives. We have husbands or wives. You have children. You, you, you have a certain car that you drive. You have a certain house that you live in, you have a certain job, a certain income bracket that you live in and whatnot. Bob says there's such things that you have. That's an old song that I used to sing when I was in the world, trying to do my own thing. But I realized it made a lot of sense. It was don't let the green grass fool you. Change your mind. You see, you might look Greener on the other side, but don't let it change 
your mind. She would look pretty across the fence. Once she get there, it get pretty ugly. <laughs> With such things that you have in your what? In your possession. The Lord has blessed you with children. You better love them like it's like, I mean like it's going out of style. The Lord gave you a house. You better appreciate that house he gave you. They got some folks slept at Salvation Army for three nights. Yeah. And after them three nights, they made them get out of there.
See, we got to be content with whatever God has blessed us with. Amen. If he put it in your hand, appreciate it. Amen. If he gave it to you, guess what? Cherish it. He gave you a wife, treat her like the queen she is. Amen. Gave you a husband, treat him like the king that he is. And guess what? If he ain't about nothing, guess what? Work hard to try to make it be so. Amen. If she ain't all that, guess what you want her to be? Guess what? Treat her like she all that. And guess what? Feed her the word of God so that the word can wash her. Yeah. That's yeah. why that's no. Mm -hmm. Appreciate what you have. See, you got to understand it's love that conquers all. Mm -hmm. The Lord gave you a little, you know, little house. Guess what? Appreciate it. Because he ain't have to give you that. Mm -hmm. They got some folk. How many of you know that some folk wish they had half of the stuff that we have? Amen. Mm -hmm. Half. Not all. Half. Half. I'm about to say something. I pray that I don't offend anybody, but it's just the truth. And I'm going to say it in a way to where you going to know what I'm talking about. There's this ethnic group. So when they come here, they'll get 20 in the house. And they'll all come up together. And everybody get their little change and they'll work and work and work and work till one can make it out. They'll work and work till the other one make it out. And they have all their food together, they have all their money together, they have all their stuff together, and they all end up what? Coming up and coming out. Lord have mercy. <laughs> Black and Baptist? <laughs> Watch me now. 
I want you to understand. Look, he said, no, forsake thee. Forsaking thee is kind of like this. So many of us know that there's laws out there where uh, uh, if a child is born and, and you say, well, I don't want the child, you can just drop him off at the hospital. You can just drop him off at a police station or you can just drop him off at a municipal building and guess what? You good. You scot free. How many of you know the law don't leave us as often? <laughs> the Lord don't just leave us and drop us off and say, you know what, I can't take care of it. Because how many of you know that we serve a God that own cattle on a thousand years? Mm -hmm. And anything that you seek and anything that you desire, anything you want, He can do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you can even ask or think. Mm -hmm. He got what you need plus some more. And I'm here to tell you, some of us have really walk into God's blessing and know and have experience that guess what? God has been good to you. Amen. And that God has gone beyond what it is that you're asking for and he showed you that guess what? I want to bless you but I just want you to understand and know that it's me you ought to trust. Yeah. Amen. Amen. My Lord, I want, you, I, want, I want you to understand this. You can stand boldly on the promise of God's provision. Mm-hmm. You can stand boldly on the promise of God's provision. What do I mean? See, you can stand boldly on that promise. See, people of God, here's what I want us to do and I want us to understand. When you, when you talk about your faith and what you believe in, don't just quote anything. Don't just, don't just be on a whim and, and you know, listen to some of these preachers throw some stuff out. But the Bible said he will never leave me nor forsake me. Guess what? I can stand on that. Mm -hmm. That's something I can stand on. And I can stand boldly on it because I know he got my back and he won't abandon me, he won't quit me, and he won't give me up for adoption. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, he adopted me when nobody else wanted me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So we've got to understand that we can stand boldly on the promises of God's provision. Well, it's, 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 it's kind of like this. It's kind of like this. You can, you can stand boldly on the promise of God's provision. How many of you know that God is there, was there, and will always be there? <laughs> I heard a story about a, a young a young boy. And every morning he wake up, he watch the news, and you know, he watch the news and okay, wow, okay. And he would go out and play on the yard, and he would come back home at the end of the day and say, Mom, I'm with it is. But they got this dude following me. I, I just can't pinpoint who he is, but he's following me. Get up the next morning. Mom said, boy, look, calm down. You know, we're going to see where it is. She called the school authority. My son said somebody following me. Said nothing. So got up, watched the news, watched, watched what was going on, went to school the next day, came back home the next day. Man, Mom, I'm telling you, Mom, this dude is following me. And then, Mom, like, with this boy. This boy I don't know his mind. So what she did was she took him to school. And what happened was the little boy was walking to class and the officer said, look, he right there. What the little boy didn't realize on a bright sunny day, he gonna see his shadow. <laughs> <laughs> and any time you have the sunshine, you gonna have your shadow. <laughs> Hey. 
is his mercy following you. And no matter where you go, it's going to follow you. Why? Because he's good, he's gracious, and he's merciful. Believe me with this song. Luther Bones made a song so satisfied. Says that I am so satisfied. I am so satisfied with my sin. He means more to me than anything, anything that this world could ever offer. I'm so satisfied. I'm so satisfied with my Savior. He means more to me than anything, anything this world could ever offer me. He says, I'm satisfied with the way that He cares for me. And how He makes a way when there seems to be no hope for me. And yes, I'm satisfied with the joy He placed in my soul. And how he helps me to bear my heavy load. Wow. He's so wonderful. He's so merciful. He looks out for me even though I'm not all that I should be. Thank you, Lord. Mm -hmm. And what makes him so very special is the fact that he gave his very life for me. Amen. I am so satisfied. And how many of you know that Jesus is looking for his children to be satisfied in him. I ain't saying he don't want you to have none. I ain't saying he don't want you to be blessed. But he wants you to be blessed in the confines in knowing that it's from him all your blessings will flow. Mm -hmm. Neighbor. Neighbor. Old neighbor. Old neighbor.